Before we get the third chapter of the Russian Civil War series going, I'd like to quickly point to a mistake I made previously in part 2. In the final part of the video, I was speaking about Denikin's Spring Offensive and stated that Denikin's white forces were split into two groups, with Denikin attacking Tsaritsyn and Wrangel attacking the Donbass. This isn't actually true. It was actually the reverse. So Wrangel was the one who actually captured Tsaritsyn and Denikin focused on the Donbass. For that reason, we are going to roll back and start in Spring 1919. Enjoy. The year 1919 was the critical juncture of the Russian Civil War. White forces were steadily advancing in Siberia, the Baltic, and southern Russia. By May, General Anton Denikin decided to make for a great overarching offensive in southern Russia, but made the fatal blunder of splitting his army into two units. He gave command of the smaller force to Baron P.N. Wrangel, who wrestled control of the city of Tsaritsyn from the Soviets on June the 30th. Meanwhile, Denikin took command of the main white forces and struck at the Donbass region. Another white leader, General Yudinich, was also in Estonia, preparing for an offensive toward Petrograd. The prospects for the Bolsheviks seemed even bleaker, with unrest mounting in Tver due to conscription, and with previous worker strikes in the cities of Tula and Astrakhan. Yet the full-on centralization of the economy and requisitioning of foodstuffs is precisely what allowed them to allocate sufficient resources to the front. This was known as war communism. To leverage themselves in the backdrop of Bolshevik expropriations, the white forces attempted to introduce land reform with the aim of luring the Russian peasantry. However, these ran in contradiction to the support of conservatives and monarchists, thus dooming it to legislative failure. For now, the only possible sign of good news was the repulsion of white forces under Kolchak to the east due to an earlier Soviet counteroffensive on Kolchak's southern flank led by Leon Trotsky and Mikhail Tukhachevsky. However, such positive news was short-lived, as Denikin again launched an offensive on the Samara Curse Axis dubbed the Moscow Directive, with the aim of capturing the city of Moscow. The ensuing chaos also allowed sporadic bands of peasants to start forming in the countryside, known as the Greens. The tide still seemed tilted in favor of the Whites, as Soviet forces were kicked out of the Baltic by August, thus opening the way to the old Russian capital. September brought a bit more hope to the Bolshevik cause, as anarchist forces under Nestor Makhno and Ukrainian nationalist forces under Simon Petlyura teamed up and harassed the rear of Denikin's forces. Still, this didn't stop white forces from advancing toward Moscow, up until the capture of Orel on October the 14th. The whites were just 400 kilometers from the heart of the beast, and were closing in for the kill with their sights on one last obstacle. Tula. To give perspective, the Allied powers in the West very much extended a helping hand to the Whites, in addition to direct intervention, thus making such a push possible. According to Michael Claude Felter, between March and September 1919 alone, the British furnished the Whites with 558 artillery pieces, 12 tanks, 1.68 million artillery rounds, and 160 million rounds of small arms ammunition. Now concurrent to the situation in Tula, General Yudinich also started his advance toward Petrograd, and although nearly taking the city, his army was decisively pushed back to Estonia by October the 25th. Yet more importantly, in the Central Theater, on October the 18th, the famed Soviet cavalry commander Semyon Budyoni launched an all-out counterattack in Tula and successfully checked the white advance. It may be no coincidence that the Bolsheviks decided to establish the Communist International during this same time period. During this time period, the Caucasus was a region of restructuring and consequently of confusion. The Armenians and Azerbaijani Musavat government were able to agree to a peace in August, even with British interventionist forces withdrawing from the region. 
However, just to the north, a North Caucasian emirate was formed and led by the elderly Naqshbani Uzun Haji in Chechnya and western Dagestan. This unsettled the Bolsheviks, who proceeded to reform some of the territory of the defunct Soviet republics of the region into the Dagestan Autonomous Republic, thus complementing the nearby Gorskaya Autonomous Republic. The new year brought further cohesion to Caucasian states, with international recognition of Georgia and Armenia. Before the British departed from the Caucasus, they were able to broker a peace between the two belligerents. However, some degree of regional peace wouldn't be reached until a Georgian-Soviet peace treaty on May the 7th, 1920. This was concurrent to the various Ossetian revolts within Georgian territory, thus eventually prompting Abkhazia to break away from Georgia and join the Gorskaya Republic. In the Central Theater, Anton Denikin's offensive ended in disaster, with the Red Army making steady gains by capturing Voronezh and then Kiev on December the 17th. His eastern counterpart, Alexander Kolchak, also faced bleak prospects, being handed over to the Bolsheviks by members of the Czechoslovakian Legion. A contemporary of the time, M. I. Smirnov, wrote, I will not enter into the sad details of the action of Czechoslovak troops, which handed over Kolchak to his enemies in accordance with an order of the French general Janin. Thus, Kolchak was executed by the Cheka on February the 7th. With the Soviet recognition of Estonian independence and Kolchak's execution, the Soviets had an opportunity for a coup de grace on white southern forces. However, knowing of the impending doom, Denikin opted to evacuate most of his forces via Novorossiysk by March of the new year, with Piotr Wrangel staying behind to safeguard Crimea. The Czechoslovakian Legion also decided on evacuating via the far eastern port of Vladivostok. A total Allied withdrawal from Siberia was followed in April, with the exception of Japan. In the Caucasus, a major Armenian revolt within Azerbaijan sufficiently distracted the Musavat government from Soviet ambitions, culminating in a successful Soviet invasion of Azerbaijan. This placed Armenia in a vulnerable position between the advancing Soviets to the east and Turkish forces under the new secular government of Mustafa Kemal. But amidst all the gloom stood Poland which took advantage of the distracted Bolsheviks. Throughout 1919, whilst Denikin and Trotsky battled it out in central Russia, the Poles had taken Vilno, thus absorbing Polish-speaking populations in their periphery. The animosity had reached a breaking point when General Joseph Pilsudski decided to invade Ukraine on April the 25th, 1920. Polish operations were initially successful with the capture of Kiev on May the 7th, but on May the 27th, a Soviet counterattack led by, you guessed it, Mikhail Tukhachevsky and Semyon Budyoni was able to decisively break the Polish attackers, pushing them back to Warsaw by July the 25th. The Soviets now grew confident and chose to create a Belarusian Soviet Republic, the spiritual successor of Litbel. However, it was in Warsaw that some would argue was the decisive engagement of the century, with the Poles providing the last bastion against communism in Central Europe. The forces of Vladislav Sikorsky and Joseph Pilsudski were able to mount a stubborn defense, thus driving the Reds back. By September, the Poles pushed back toward the Pripet Marshes, however an armistice was reached on October the 12th. This was rectified by the Peace Treaty of Riga signed in March of the next year, in which the Belarusian Soviet Republic was effectively reduced in size. I'd also like to take the time to thank all my patrons listed below. These videos would truly not be possible without their support. If you'd like to become a patron, please be sure to check the Patreon link in the pinned post and description.